Alright, cool. I'm going to start with my topic, which is chemical reactions and premix flames. And my name is Eric Carpenter. So, very gloss on the flame vision, you know. By Chuck Bauman. Alright, so there are two types of chemical reactions that we know, which is hot and cold types. So it's exothermic and endothermic. And so one releases energy and the other will absorb energy around it. So like if you think about most of the reactions we see today, which is um, exothermic, but this one we don't see as much with endothermic, which is where you make something or it's some, a reaction happens between two things and it will absorb the energy around it. So like ammonium chloride with water will cool down and it's cool fast. Okay. <laughs> Exothermic. This is basically everywhere. It's fire, it's in your it's combustion, it's anything that releases heat energy. It could be um, and basically everything around you you think of as a chemical reaction, which is probably exothermic. But um, here, an example I wanted to do was if you take bismuth, it's just a, a metal on the periodic table, uh, it's number 83, and it looks pretty cool. But what happens is you can just put it through a simple chemical reaction and you'll end up like demonstrating some of those things. So if you burn it with oxygen, which is a gas, and bismuth, which is the metal, of course, you have to get it up to a higher temperature. But if you get it to burn, you'll produce a product that could be useful in like actual life, like real life, which is, um, well, they combine and they release energy in the form of a com and also a compound. So they release light energy and heat energy and all this energy because it's an exothermic process. So yeah, Putin, why? Um, and so what they form is something called bismuth trioxide, which is used in the fireworks you see that are all long and drapey, like the streams of light. And this, so it, I'm just trying to prove to you guys that chemical reactions are useful not just with the heat, but in the product. And so a summary for all the <laughs> chemical reactions we have is that they're not always burning, and they're, but we use them constantly around us in our everyday lives, and that products are very useful. We don't just can't just get everything raw out of the ground. We have to produce some stuff from chemical reactions. And so this is um, a video I pulled up, just another example of the, the chemical reactions. This is a boring old gummy bear, and this is what happens when you drop it into boiling potassium chlorine. Whoa, that was awesome. But we're at 19, and this is the world's largest gummy bear. So... shows you a more extreme <laughs> reaction, but it's um, just another example of a chemical reaction.
We'll start the other half of my topic, which is going to be premixed flames. So this is talking about uh, supplying oxygen, not just collecting from, the, or not just letting it burn with the oxygen in the atmosphere, but actually trying to mix it into the fuel before it actually ignites. So there's a couple different examples of like different burning. And so why we use this is because it works where maybe there is not enough oxygen, and also it's way cleaner burn. So it's not uh, producing soot, and it's a lot, so it's shorter, and it's a lot just more efficient, and um, will also be hotter, and also more reliable, because it doesn't rely on any of the air around it. You're supplying the air, so everything's there for it to work. It doesn't have to wait for anything to happen. So, I'll explain this more in a second. Okay, application. So space, which is <laughs> funny, but it's true because by using liquid fuel, it's oxygen and a propellant, you're able to mix them together and ignite them. And because there is no oxygen in space, or even in the upper atmosphere, it kind of gets a little harder. to. So you use that and you'll have a constant flame. So a bunch of burners also use this, but you can adjust the mix. So this is kind of helps visualize it where you shell off the valve at the bottom, there is no mixing happening. So it's just it's using the air around it. But if you flip it all the way open, it'll be complete um, mix and hotter. And say, so it's let, so this is where the Bunsen burner gets good. It gets burns hotter. It's a shorter flame. There's less soot, and it's way more reliable. It's not flickering around. It's always right there for you, and it has the to come in. So afterburners are another example of this, where the, everything's all mixed up already, and as it shoots out through the back, everything's already there for it to burn. It's not like flipping around, like trying to get oxygen from where it is around it, it's actually, it has it all there ready for it. So now we start talking about my scientist and my mathematician, and one of them is Robert Hooke. So this is a man who is mostly forgotten because he messed with Newton, and Newton didn't like that as soon as he started doing that. He's a little bit of a patent control, kind of, he always wanted credit for everything, but he actually did have a really big uh, thing in biology which is called micrographia. He invented a type of microscope where he was able to look at small life forms such as flies and see they have like all the little hexagons in their eyes and everything like that. And this is the microscope he used. It's called a the hook microscope, and it's about the 1760 era. So he used um, a oil lamp and a water glass to kind of get the rough reading, and then he also and then he basically used a series of lenses. But Hooke's law, which is what most people, what we use him for, what we've been talking about is his experimentation with spring and how he's able to figure out uh, the equation f equals kx, which is like the spring constant multiplied by the distance you move it. So this is where he gets into trouble a little bit. Another guy named um, Christian Huynh was also working on the same thing with springs, and they both wanted credit. So they, he started getting into a little bit of scuffles over things. And, but the huge war he got in was with Newton, when he said that he helped theorize gravity which is a pretty big claim, and Newton didn't like pretty big claims from a guy that doesn't, hadn't do, done anything. Basically, what he did is he wrote a letter to Newton. Okay, well, here, this is what, it, I'll explain it. Hope was full of himself, and he wrote a letter to Newton saying that he knew so much about gravity, and Newton just kind of blew it off, and he saw how dumb everybody was around him about gravity and how far he was ahead. And he's, and by, with all these claims from him saying he helped Newton, uh, Newton came back with, I've seen it further, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants, um, which basically is uh, just a total, like, burn to, uh, <laughs> to Hook, because he was a short guy. And he was basically just saying, I didn't do anything from Hook, it's from the actual, like, people that did things. So, Newton, uh, the worst mistake that Hook had was dying way before Newton. So, Hook died. Newton took over the Royal Society and he destroyed Hook's portrait, or just let it be destroyed because he didn't like him at all. And recapitulation of what Hook did, he had a wide range of, sci of influence in science. He built a microscope in the so he, he had huge advancements in biology. He figured out springs, all the equations we use, the equations we use today to model springs, and everything just took off from there. Like he laid a really good basis for it. And the only problem was he always wanted credit for anything he did, even if it wasn't really anything. And this is what got him in all the fights, and what got him basically like just pushed to the side by Newton, so no one ever knew about him again. Now we're starting Isaac Newton, who is the other guy on the end of the equation, but also pretty much the main guy in all of science and math, everything we learn about. So you know, I, so this is he advanced every math is basically what the general idea is that he helped he generalized the binomial theorem. 
he made Newton identities. He like came up with Newton's method for, appro for approximation. He worked, messed with cubic plane curves and polynomials. He made finite differences happen, and also he really uh, helped with coordinate geometry, which Kevin said before about um, Descartes, age, but he really uh, experimented with it. So basically, he went through every single type of math and made some type of advancement in it, no matter how small or how big. But uh, so everything he did was just it helped build up all the math that we did today. All right. Okay, so he also did power series and logarithmic, logarithmic approximation to harmonic sequences. So basically, he started messing with logs and everything we do now to approximate things. So he started the approximation. He started doing rough, so we could do everything faster. And this is his work in optics. He basically, he's the one who kind of looked at the whole how a prism diffracted light. And he saw that no matter how you bounce it around, the light would always stay in that pattern. You can't change the color of the light. And he also came up with Newton's theory of color based on this, which is that objects don't emit color. They like bounce it off themselves. They're not making color. And he um, made the reverse like refracting telescope, which brings a mirror to look through it, which is why you don't have to line it up with all the lenses. And mechanics of gravitation, this is what he's really famous for, which is force equal, this is angular um, acceleration, centrifugal force, all these good things. And he can, this is, his main work was Principia, which is where he published the three laws of motion that we all know and have basically built like all of our physics off of, like for this class too also. Um, and also he came up with calculus to prove the speed of the, uh, I missed it, okay, mechanics of gravitation. So this is where he uses Newton's canon and everything, and he inferred the oblateness of the spheroidal, spheroidal figure of the Earth. So he figured out that it's not a perfect circle through a lot of his calculations. Basically, Newton was a boss. He invented calculation, <laughs> calculus, or helped, so like, so there's a whole Leibniz thing. He uh, truly theorized gravity. He was the one who was thinking about orbits and all this stuff, and all these equations. And he figured out light, which was the whole color thing. It, what colors weren't made, they were refracted off of things. And he also discovered orbits with his canon and modeled planetary motion also with the canon with orbits and getting like falling out like we talked about with satellites. So Newton did a lot, but all in all, he still uh, <laughs> was almost as cool as I mean Newton and Hooke were almost as cool as Euler. <laughs> did a lot, but Euler did more for us. Right. And then I have a short video at the end, which is a rap battle. That there's a it's a. There's a there's a channel on YouTube, of course, probably everybody knows, that <laughs> does the rap battles between uh, historical figures, and this one was really interesting. So I decided might as well throw it in there. I mean, yeah. half, I just caused this to drop from too. <laughs> one of the biggest choke points in construction is the movement of information. Construction.
Why don't you pick on the brain?